tell us about maybe the possibility of a, a Friday news dump today uh, from the NCAA. Is that an option? Yeah, I think that's definitely a possibility. Not not saying it's definitely going to happen, but timing-wise, it makes some sense. Um, here's how the NCAA works. They give the school uh, a 24 hours notice that it's coming, um, and, and then they will alert the media about three or four hours before it's going to be released. So, um, for example, they might release something at the top of this hour, and then the news dump could come at noon Eastern. Uh, Tennessee's not allowed to comment on anything until after the NCAA has a media call to discuss their ruling, and then Tennessee will offer a statement, uh, would be my guess after that. I don't think Tennessee will have a formal press conference. They'll just offer a statement. Tennessee will not get the ruling uh, or notify. They will not know what the ruling is until, oh, probably an hour and a half before it's released. That'll mm-hmm. give them and their lawyers time to come up with a statement and, and go from there. And I, I think whatever Tennessee says whenever all this happens will come out of the chancellor's office because it happened on her watch. It didn't happen on Danny White's watch. Uh, so I think anything that comes out of that will come from the chancellor's office uh, whenever this news dump happens. And, again, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's today. The 90-day window is hits on Wednesday. Next week is 90 days. They're not going to do that to Tennessee and Josh Heupel and say, hey, we're going to give this to you on a Wednesday afternoon. You're doing, you know, SEC Nation Wednesday night, and and then you're going to stand in front of the podium all day on Thursday, and you're the first one to really make a comment about it. So I I don't think that will be the way they go, which is why I think it's a possibility it could happen today. Friday is not – the NCAA dumps a lot of stuff or puts out a lot of news a lot of times midday on Friday. So – I won't be surprised if it happens. Don't know for sure, but it won't shock me at all. So, Brent, you mentioned this in the the war room today as well, and on three and, and volquest dot com that uh, if Tennessee were docked twenty five to thirty scholarships, just the way this would work, kind of walk us through, if you will, the procedure of if it's just scholarships, which uh, I feel like a lot of Tennessee fans certainly that's the better alternative than a postseason ban. Uh, how would this work over the next two three seasons uh, for Tennessee football? Well, you know, whatever that's released, whenever the, the, you know, the punishment's announced, it won't be surprising if they say, you know, to, to make it look really bad, Tennessee was docked, you know, 25 or 30 scholarships. And the first reaction from fans is, wait a minute, we're going to have 50 players to go play football? Like, how does that work? Yeah. And that's not how it works, okay? You're, you're docking the scholarships over a period of time. Okay, however long the probation period is, if it's four years, five years, three years, whatever. And it's also important to note that Tennessee heading into this year, not counting this year, heading into this year has already self-imposed 16 scholarship reductions. So let's say you get a four-year probationary period and you get 25 scholarship reductions. Okay, between now and the end of that four years, Tennessee would have to do nine nine more scholarship reductions. So the bottom line is it's not ideal, but Tennessee's not going to line up and play with 75 scholarship players. They're not going to be crippled. Nobody's crippling anybody like that. Um, And I just think that's important to note for fans because when they see whatever the number is, whenever all this comes out, the first reaction is going to be that they're taking away 30 immediately or 25 or whatever that number is, and you think your program's crippled. You know, you're like, hey, we're SMU. That's not how this works. And, and so Tennessee has had a basically a 30-month plan to try to anticipate some of these things and to try to put themselves in a position to start getting through some of it, uh, which is why they self-imposed many of the things they self-imposed, um, including some recruiting restrictions they put on themselves to help navigate these waters. What Tennessee did not do and what they have fought from the get-go is a postseason ban. And Tennessee's feeling on that is that you're not supposed to. The NCAA has said we're not going to punish players who weren't involved. None of the players on this team left were, were involved. That's why they didn't um, punish them. And they, they went ahead and went to the Music City Bowl uh, two years ago and, and obviously played in the Orange Bowl last year. And that's what Tennessee's fighting. I mean, there's going to be a fine. There's going to be a financial fine come. It'll be a hefty fine. I think it'll be in the high seven figures uh, that, that Tennessee will have to pay over a period of time. 
but Tennessee is okay is more okay with that. They don't want that, but they're much more okay with that than current players being punished who had nothing to do with any of this and a current staff of coaches and administrators who had nothing to do with what happened when Jeremy Pruitt was here. On the other side of this ruling, that's where I want to go now, is what 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 about the assistant coaches and Jeremy Pruitt? What what do you think their 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 punishments uh will be or should be, I guess, after this ruling? Well that's a great question. And and obviously several of those guys have already taken a deal, right? Uh, Drew Hughes, who was an administrator, has taken a deal. Brian Niedermeyer has taken his deal from the NCAA already to try to get moving forward. Derek Ansley has not, so he would get punished. Now, Ansley has no desire to be back in the college game, so I don't think Derek Ansley gives two rats for it's what his NCAA punishment is because I think he feels like the, the NFL is a better fit for him. He's obviously in a situation in, in L.A. that – um, he's now a coordinator. He's making good money. He feels good. I mean, he left basically in the middle of the night and said, y'all don't worry about paying me no buyout monies. I'm not going to fight for any of that. I'm out of here. And he packed up and left. So I don't think it matters to him. Jeremy Pruitt is the one. And the question is what kind of show calls does Jeremy Pruitt get? Now Pruitt's people obviously uh, have some optimism based on the fact that Will Wade was not hit crippling and a lot of people thought will wade was going to get crippled with the show calls and, and he didn't uh but we'll see what happens i mean jeremy pruitt's name is basically involved in 18 level one violations uh which tells you you know that you think he's going to get a pretty hefty show calls and not be back in in college ball in, in any time in the immediate future but you never really know how the ncaa rules just like we don't think tennessee is going to get a postseason ban but Oklahoma State basketball didn't think they were going to get a postseason ban. Ramon, when they got theirs out of the blue, yeah. and a bunch of guys were in the eighth grade when the penalties took place at Oklahoma State, they didn't get to play in the NCAA tournament. Um, so we'll see. You know, if, if Tennessee gets a ruling they're comfortable with, they'll move on. If not, there's an appeal process. The only thing Tennessee's going to appeal, in my opinion, would be if there is a postseason ban of some kind. They will fight that, and they will appeal that to the highest court they can appeal it to if that were to come out. Uh, Brand SEC Media Days next week. So next week, and one of the uh, players coming, I'm I'm fascinated by, but I respect the heck out of him as a young guy. Zamari Thomas, man. Uh, seeing your in, in the war room right up, you said, you know, it's been asked of him to be more vocal. One, having a name like Big O. Mm-hmm. Like that in itself lets you know the respect factor that he has. But what has he been to this team and his journey to this point now? Well, I mean, he, he's a guy who does everything the right way, okay? He's always on time. He always does everything he's supposed to do. So he's a very much lead-by-example kind of guy. What Rodney Garner wants is Rodney Garner is looking for somebody to help him stick a boot in somebody's rear end if they have to. <laughs> that's, yeah. not, um, that's not Big O's biggest nature, right? Like, I don't want to call him a teddy bear because he's intense on the field. But, but he is a always smiling, shaking your hand, talking to any kid that walks by him, anybody in the complex, whether it's an administrator or a fellow student athlete, he's always got time for him. I mean, he's just a super nice guy. And so his challenge and what Rodney Garner has challenged him with is, you know, to be a leader, you can't always be the nicest guy. You have to sometimes get after people if you need to. And that's been something that they have worked on. Uh, with Big O, and and I think he's gotten somewhat better at it. I don't think it's his most comfortable nature to bark at one of his teammates or to really crawl up in a guy. But um, he he's a better leader vocally. He's always been a great leader by example, and he is a great representative of the University of Tennessee. Great family. Grandmother's the sweetest lady you'll ever meet. <laughs> um, he take the administrators. They were school teachers and involved in and education for a long time and um, just a guy who was really raised the right way and, and it shows in, in the way he carries himself. Brent, I, think that. I would like to get your just opinion since you've you've seen a lot of SEC media days. You, you know, they've been going on for a long time. Like, what, what do you think about the SEC media days, just the week of, you know, it's kind of for us, obviously, but do you feel like there's anything significant that we actually get out of these types of things now? No, I don't, and and that and that's not a knock on anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, when you talk about 
20 years ago when you covered this thing, 25 years ago when you covered it, there were a handful of, of sports talk shows going on. But Nashville didn't have an all-sports station at that point in time, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Knoxville didn't have one or two or three or however many they've got in Knoxville now. Uh, so there's so much discussion of football year-round that it's not the kickoff that it used to be. Yep. You know, it used to be this big, all right, football's here. Well, football never stops, <laughs> you know? And mm-hmm. so um, everybody, I've always joked, you know, wouldn't you love to have a coach go to the podium and just say, we had the worst off season I've ever seen a football team have. Yeah. We were terrible. We put in no effort. We've gotten weaker. We've not gotten faster. We're soft. We're this. But instead, it's we're the best summer we've ever had. We have great leadership. We have a great football team. Our strength cats coach, and everybody does a great job. If you've had coaching changes on your staff, it's good to get fresh blood. If you don't, it's great to have continuity. And it's just it's a bit of a PR spin, yep. you know, anymore. So I don't think there's great news in it, but it it does get everybody started, I guess, a little bit with football. So it's not a bad thing. It just it's not the news value that it once had. Off the uh, gridiron and onto the uh, hard court here, and we're talking about Chris Ledlum and decided to transfer, enter back into the NCAA transfer portal. Um, I think that surprised us here. It surprised a lot of people. What can you tell us a little bit more about maybe why he did this? Well, it surprised the Tennessee coaching staff as much as it surprised anybody else out there. Um, Chris went to, to Coach Barnes Wednesday morning and told him he wanted to get back closer to home and was heading out. Ari had his plane ticket bought. There was no talking out of it, and and he was gone. Uh, Why? You know, I think he's going to end up at St. John's, which is closer to home. Uh, So maybe he did have some homesickness. I think the other thing, too, and and I don't think it was intentional, but I think Chris Ledman felt like when he came in, one of the spots he was going to take and the minutes he was going to take was the minutes vacated by Josiah Jordan James' departure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Tennessee likes to play small ball. They like to play with James at the four. So Ledlam thought he would play a lot of those minutes at the four and would get, you know, 25 minutes a game, 28 minutes a game. Then all of a sudden, here's this Josiah Jordan James, who's been the face of the program for the last four years, back. He's back at practice. He knows everything that's going on. Anytime that the coaching staff needs to show newcomers what to do, what do they do? Get out here, Josiah, and show mm-hmm. everybody what it is. And I think Chris Ludlam went, you know what? I'm not going to get nearly as many minutes here as I thought I was going to get. And I think as a result of that, he had the opportunity to use his grad transfer waiver so he could he could transfer a second time and has decided that to head, to head elsewhere. And, and I think it's going to ultimately end up being St. John's, which was the – other okay. finalists along with Indiana for him, you know, when he decided to transfer from Harvard. So my guess is he's more comfortable closer to home. I think he feels like his playing time is going to be better elsewhere than it would have been at Tennessee. Brent Hubbs, our guest this morning on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. Uh, Brent, we have a uh, an audience question from Grant R. in Maryville, Tennessee. <laughs> uh, no, I am um, I, I'm against answering anything. He is blacklisted. He is banned, blacklisted. so we're not going to take that question. Oh, perfect. Because <laughs> uh, hypothetically, if I were to ask this question, I would say – uh, his submission was, did SEC Media Days 25 years ago used to be in black and white like the Andy Griffith show was? <laughs> yes, it was. It was, like when the, it was like when the movie company came to town and they were going to cut down the old oak tree in the middle. Now, Ramon has no idea what I'm talking about, but when the mayor's daughter was going to sing... Uh, right before they cut down the old oak tree. That's exactly how SEC oh Media Day felt 25 years ago. Of course, that's great, Ramey, for those of you who are unfamiliar. But uh, a friend of the show and VolQuest.com basketball writer. But, um, uh, Brent, it is it is funny. We actually had Andy Staples on, Ramon 3, yesterday. And I think we are going to commission an oral history of the 2004 SEC Media Days for the mm-hmm. 20th anniversary next year between Philip Fulmer and subpoena gate that was going on at the time. And then Nick Saban's dog getting loose in <laughs> the Winfrey wow. hotel in Hoover. It's amazing that those two things were allowed to happen in the same year at sec media days. Well, and it's amazing that Kayla asked me, what do you make of sec media days? And that's the highlight. Yes. <laughs> a running yes. dog, a subpoena and a voice box. <laughs> Um, where Philip Fulmer is talking into a voice box into a large room 
because he wasn't allowed to, to come <laughs> the next year, I guess. Um, yeah, bizarre times. Only in the SEC does such things happen. Yep. Um, so it's, it is it is what it is with SEC media days. We're all excited it's in Nashville because, A, we love Nashville, and, B, we love Nashville because it's really close. Yeah, true. this is very true. Makes Absolutely. it better. We're, so we're selfish. <laughs> yeah, that's okay, right? Well, we love that we can walk over and uh, and be there uh-huh. too. So certainly we're with you. Uh, 